Well, hello, everybody. Yes, another edition of Zoom Land Lieutenant Talk Radio. It is today, May 11, 2024, and glad that everybody's coming out to participate in these Zoom meetings. Uh, I think it's really invaluable for uh, our community to step up and get the education that they that they need. Last week, uh, we had a couple of questions that I wanted to get back to this week. So I took a look at it. Uh, we had actually a couple of questions, mostly dealing with uh, SB 567, which is also the Code of Civil Procedure Section 1946.2. And these code sections aren't earth shattering. They don't really do too much damage to landlords. It does tighten up in the uh, the legislator's mind two aspects, and that was dealing one with an owner or relative move-in, and also dealing with a remodel or a demolition of the premises. So let's take one at a time and let's see how the law changed under SB 567. Uh, for an owner move-in, number one, you have to, and, and again, we're only talking about property that is subject to statewide rent control. If your property is, is subject to a local rent control, then the local rent control controls. So we're talking about just statewide rent control. And if you wanted to move in or have a family member move in, in the past, all you had to do was to serve a 60-day notice on a month-to-month -month tenancy, uh, assuming he's been there longer than one year, offer him one month's relocation, and the tenant would have to move. Now, in this situation, they have tightened it up where, number one, if you've entered into a rental agreement from July 1st, 2020, you have to have a phrase in that rental agreement, which the tenant consents to, that says, hey, we might evict you, we might ask you to move for a family member. If you've entered into that rental agreement from July 1st, 2020, and you have not, have not put that phrase in the rental agreement, then technically you can't ask that tenant to move because you yourself want to move in or a family member. So that's issue number one. Uh, there was a person that called in uh, last week uh, and I did tell him the correct answer, but I wanted to make sure. And that is, if your rental agreement was entered into prior to July 1st, 2020, there's no necessity for you to serve a change of terms of tenancy. If it, your rental agreement was entered into prior to that date, all you need to do is to serve a 60-day notice and disclose who the family member is. Now, right now, the law changed where you have to actually give the name of the person who's moving in and the relationship to the owner. Uh, the tenant, uh, the person who's moving in has to move in within 90 days and stay for at least 12 months. Uh, if not, then you're going to have to offer the unit back to the tenant at the same rate. And also the tenant would be entitled to be reimbursed for any moving expenses uh, with regard to having to move back in. Another important factor with regard to the owner move-in is that if your relative or yourself does stay there, you move in within the 90 days, and then you move out uh, after the first year, the unit is not decontrolled. So if the previous tenant was paying $800, then when you rent it to the next person, you're going to have to charge the same amount of rent, $800, plus any applicable increases that under state law that you could have done. Okay, so that's with regard to uh, the uh, owner moving under SB 567. They also say that the tenant has the right to ask you for proof of the relationship. The other thing with regard to SB 567 deals with substantial renovation. That really hasn't changed too much in that you uh, are allowed to evict the tenant if you are going to substantially renovate the unit. The work must take longer than 30 days to complete, rendering it uninhabitable for that period of time and also requires a building permit. Well, now they've changed it slightly where you have to now in your notice have the description of what you will be doing for this renovation, the approximate time that it's going to take 
to complete the renovation. You have to also obtain the permits. And also you have to state in your notice that if in fact the tenant is interested in reoccupying that he can after the work is done. But of course, after the um, work has been completed. Now, if in fact the landlord doesn't do the procedures and the tenant is evicted, they've now opened this up where tenants can now sue landlords for not strictly complying with the law. So, uh, and obviously you got to strictly comply with the law. These kinds of notices are very technical. If you are subject to statewide rent control and you do want to move in, I certainly recommend that um, you um, get the services of an attorney. Uh, trying to do it without an attorney, I think you're going to fall on your face. Okay, let's move on. Guess what? May 15th, 2024, coming up Wednesday next week, me, Dennis Block, will be speaking at the Pasadena Convention Center. I'll be speaking at about one o'clock. There is an apartment expo trade show there, which I highly recommend. It's sponsored by the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. Admission is free. So come on down, you'll get to hear other speakers. Of course, not as handsome as I am. Uh, and also you'll get to see all these vendors which are showing their services and products. And uh, you'll learn how to efficiently uh, run your buildings uh, better. So I definitely recommend just walk around all the booths. It's all free and you can catch some of the seminars and then just get ready for mine, which is like at one o'clock. I'm going to be speaking about um, uh, getting a proper tenant and some of the new laws. But how do you get a proper tenant so you never have to call me with a problem tenant? You know, if you screen your tenants very well, then uh, you never need the services of an eviction attorney. So uh, the trick is, what do you do to get a good tenant? Uh, and I'll give you a little flavor of what I'm going to be talking about. Most people think that the first thing you do when you lease out a unit is uh, you hand an application to the tenant to fill out that, or the applicant to fill out. That would be the first uh, go around. But of course, that's not what you do. The first thing you do, ladies and gentlemen, is you videotape or take pictures of your unit. You want to see exactly the way the unit looked before the tenant took possession. So by doing that, what you're going to find out is that when the tenant claims that those conditions existed from day one, you'll have photographic proof that they didn't. So that's just one uh, tip I'm going to tell everybody when they're renting out a unit. Before the application, make sure that you have the unit well documented with pictures and maybe even video to show that all the cupboards were on the door, that you had all the screens, there was no broken windows, and that the unit was very clear. Okay, that's my uh, topic for today. Again, don't forget uh, the 15th of May uh, at the Pasadena Convention Center. Come on out. Uh, the only thing you got to pay for, ladies and gentlemen, is the parking. Uh, but other than that, it should be a really enjoyable day and you'll get to really learn a lot, uh, just like you do from uh, these um, Zoom meetings that we do. I am going to open it up to questions right now, and the um, rules are as follows. If you do want to talk to me, please uh, electronically raise your hand. It's on the toolbar there on your Zoom meeting. And um, if you do ask a question, please try to keep it succinct so we can get through all the questions. I see we have a lot of people with questions today. God bless you. Uh, also, if you are uh, have an existing case with me. Uh, I really do not want to discuss that. That's something that you would have to talk, call the office, and we're happy to talk to you about that. And last but not least, if you do have a um, uh, these webinars, these Zoom meetings are for informational purposes only. It's not a substitute for quality legal advice. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to open it up. And the first person I see who I'm seeing right now is Janice. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Hi, Dennis. Um, follow up on uh, SB 567. Um, I was referring to exempt properties, single family homes that aren't 
LLCs or et cetera. Um, CAA is saying in an article about 567 that there, even if you're exempt, you have to notify the tenants. But of course, there's no information on in what period of time or, you know, the details. Well, the details are simple. You have to, if you release out a property, you have to state in that in that rental agreement that the premises are exempt from statewide rent control. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So I have that in my rental agreement as a little box. So if your property is subject or is in an area, you're not under a local jurisdiction, or maybe you are in a, let's say the city of Los Angeles, but it's a single family home Actually, I don't want to say that because now LA has everything is under the LA statute. But if you do have a property that let's pretend two units in Glendale, which would then not be subject to the Glendale rent control ordinance, you have to. So therefore, it's going to be subject to statewide rent control. But if it's a newer unit, you have to state in your rental agreement to the tenant that it is exempt. So just make sure that if your property would otherwise be subject to statewide rent control that you uh, check that box in my rental agreement or at least have that phrase in there. But I, I thought the language of CAA's article seems to suggest that when you give notice to the tenants, d does that need to get repeated? No, it's just, it has to be contained in the rental agreement signed by the tenant. Okay. Anyway, thank you. thank you very much, Janice. We are going to move on to a regular Jim Polina. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Hey, Dennis. How's it going? Going really good. It's Saturday. I'm happy. Great, great. Hey, I have um, a question, and hopefully these are easy for you. Uh, this concept of a rolling late. If a tenant is late on making their rent payment, uh, first of all, do I need to um, give them notice? Hey, you're late. You know, you have this extra fee you, you have to pay. And if they don't pay it, next month comes around, they pay rent. Can I deduct the late fee from that the next month's rent, and then therefore that month's rent is late because it's on a full payment? Like the idea of a rolling late just keeps going and going. Okay, so here's how you handle that situation. Number one, you have to have the proper language in your rental agreement in order for it to be a legal late charge. So it's not just if you pay your rent late, then you have to pay me 6% or a $50 late fee. If it says that, then it doesn't have the proper language. If you uh, move over to my rental agreement, which is on my website, evict123.com, uh, which is in the free form section, take a look at that paragraph. And it talks about the fact that you're adding additional cost and accounting and labor because you're not paying your rent on time. So a specific language. But let's pretend that you do have the correct language and let's pretend it's a $50 late fee. So your position is, okay, he paid me late in the month of May. So what I'm going to do in June, when he pays me the $1,000, I'm going to take the first $50 of that thousand. I'm going to apply it towards the late fee. And therefore, you now owe me uh, $50 in rent. You can't do that. Uh, but I have an easy solution for you. You can't do that because the debtor is the one who determines what debt he is paying, not the creditor. In this situation, the tenant is the one deciding. So if the rent's a thousand and he gives you a thousand, you know he meant it for the rent. But there's something easily that you can do in a situation like that, and that is dust off a simple notice to perform or quit. That's a three day notice to perform or quit, similar to a notice to pay rent or quit. But in this case, it's through dealing with some other violation under the rental agreement. So by preparing a notice to perform or quit, you're going to write, you paid your rent 10 days late in the month of May. You owe me $50. You got three days to pay. You serve that notice on him. If he doesn't pay, you have the right to do an eviction. So if he doesn't pay time and time again, the late fee, can I just deduct it eventually from the security deposit? Well, yes and no. Uh, from a security deposit, don't you love the lawyer answers? From a security <laughs> deposit, you're only allowed to deduct for unusual wear and tear, cleaning, and rent. Now, late charges are not rent. However, this is the but, 
If you go to my rental agreement, it says any monetary obligation owed under the rental agreement constitutes rent. So on that basis, it's rent and you can deduct it from the security deposit or you can bring forth an eviction uh, against your tenant by serving this notice to perform a quit. Now, are you really going to evict the tenant for $50? And the answer is maybe, maybe if you've got a, let's say an ocean view uh, duplex under statewide rent control uh, in Redondo Beach, okay? And the rent's $642. Hell right, you pay me my rent late. I'm going to serve you that late charge, that three-day notice, and I'm going to pray you don't pay within the three days so I can get rid of you. So it all it all depends. But again, if you have that phrase in your rental agreement, then you are allowed to deduct it. Anyway, thank you very much, unless there's a hey, Dennis. Can I ask you a second question here? It's a, it's a pretty easy softball for you. Um, in my lease, I have what I think is a very uh, one-sided clause. And it states that if I enter escrow to sell my property, I'm in escrow, I can give a 60-day notice to terminate the lease in mid-stride, mid-term. Is that legal? It depends. If you're, if you're not under any rental jurisdiction, then it would be legal. But otherwise, if you're under a, a jurisdiction that has good cause to evict, like statewide rent control and all the other ones, then no, that, that you're going to be uh, subjected to that law. OK, thank you. OK, Jim. OK, I see DC. DC, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself if you're there. Okay, DC, last chance. Probably having technical difficulty. I'm going to move on to Eileen. Yeah. Hello. Oh, DC is there. Yeah, Hello. there I am. Oh, yeah. I, okay. Then uh, the question is uh, I have, uh, I'm renting to a husband and wife, uh, but only the wife is the one that signed the lease because he was. Uh, uh, he was out of the country anyway and so and they have uh, so there's the two husband and, i mean there's a husband and wife and two children now the children are adults now if i serve a three-day notice um a three-day notice do i only put the husband and wife even though he didn't he didn't sign the agreement but he's well, a tenant he pays rent and everything under community property laws i think he, his signature obligated her so I would put the, both the husband and the wife's name in the notice. I would not put the children's name. Oh, okay. Unless they uh, disappear and the kids stay back, then all of a sudden they, they're my tenants from then forward, right? What city? It's, oh, it's city of LA rent control. Yeah, they were proper tenants because they moved in, so they're all protected. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Right. Thank okay, let's move on. I'm sorry, Eileen. I kind of teased you there, but if you're there, I'll talk to you now. Eileen, please unmute yourself. Hi, how are you? Hello. Um, thank you for providing this service. I'm going to try to give you a fast background and then I'll answer, I'll ask you the question. My husband and brother and I own a single family house in Hawthorne under our revocable trusts. We have been renting the, to the same husband and wife uh, family. They have a couple of children for 14 years. Uh, about, about when the the COVID pandemic started, they started having trouble paying their rent. They'd be a month late, two months late. We were working with them on it. They would get grants to pay their rent. So they've, they've always been catching up. They're caught up now. The husband uh, was in hospice for approximately a year. He just passed away a couple months ago. Um, so here's, here's where the question comes. Um, while he was in hospice, um, she started renting rooms out in the house without our permission. She's on a month to month because the one year lease converted to a month to month lease a few years ago. Um, and then last weekend we got a call from the mother of one of the adults who is subletting from her saying that she's trying to evict him with less than 30 days notice. So a how do we get rid of all these subtenants? <laughs> B, what kind of liability do we have if we allow her to sublease? Um, that's probably the two big questions. I don't necessarily want to evict her if she will abide by the rules and start paying her rent on time because she's got little kids, but I don't want all these subtenants. Okay, well, first of all, the fact that she's bringing forth an eviction against one of her subtenants 
that has nothing to do with you. You don't care about that. You only care about your property and its condition. You care about getting your rent and you care about peace and tranquility in the neighborhood. So that those are what most landlords are concerned about. Uh, with regard to your tenant, obviously uh, she's violating the terms of her contract. And I don't want to call them sub rent because you can never prove if somebody's paying rent or not. But your rental agreement says who can live there. She's got other people living there. So again, that would be that same type of notice that I was talking about with regard to the late charge, where you would serve a notice to perform or quit, giving him three days to get rid of the strangers. At the end of the third day, I guarantee you the strangers will still be there. And then you can bring <laughs> forth an eviction. If the tenant at this moment in time also owes rent, I would serve both notices, a notice to pay rent or quit and a notice to perform or quit. It's kind of like having two bullets in your gun. So if you lose on one, you still win on the other. But again, you don't want all these people in there. What's your liability? Your liability, if you know one guy takes a gun out and shoots the other guy, you have no liability. You only have liability if there was a condition in the house, a dangerous condition that you reasonably knew or should have known and you didn't take care of it. Most people think, for example, that if somebody gets hurt on my property, I am liable. And then I always give them the following example. If somebody's on your property and an airplane falls from the sky and hits them on the head, are you responsible? And the answer is obviously no. So you can see by that example that the fact that somebody's on your property doesn't make you responsible. Another example, which I always love is, if you're walking in Ralph's market and you slip on a banana peel, is the market liable? And the answer is not necessarily. If a kid just threw the banana peel on the ground and two seconds later you slipped on it, the market's not liable. The market is supposed to, I would imagine, uh, patrol the aisles maybe every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes. But if it just happened, how could the, the uh, market be responsible for something like that? So in any event, in your situation, I would definitely, because uh, you don't want these strangers there. And, and while you have to feel sorry for them, so you're tugging on somebody's heartstrings here for her situation, but I would have a heart-to-heart -heart talk saying she's got to get rid of these people. Otherwise, she should just move out of the property. Otherwise, it's eviction time. Okay. Should we have the heart to heart talk with a witness or should we just serve her the notice to perform or quit? Well, I don't know. You know, it, it's going to be so difficult. I think it's only the only avenue is the eviction because even if she wants these people out, like she wants that one tenant out, they're not going to leave. So you're going to need to go forward with an eviction. Okay. And then we would evict her and unknown occupants. Yeah. yeah everybody goes. So. Okay. okay. All right. Thank nice talking with you. And we are moving on to, I see iPhone here. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. And if you're actually talking on the iPhone, you would, oh, there you go. You're there. there you How are you doing, Dennis? Thank you so much for this conference. I wanted to know, um, what is the path to get a hoarder out of a single family dwelling when you're selling the house? Okay, well, obviously, first of all, what city, please? Los Angeles. Okay, so the fact that you're selling the house, even if the tenant's on a month-to-month -month tenancy and it's only a single family residence, yes, can't just serve a 30 or a 60 day notice to quit. You have to have cause. Cause is not that I'm selling the property. So with regard to the hoarder, I presume that you have a rental agreement with her, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, every yes. rental agreement states that the premises must be kept in a neat and sanitary condition. Yes. Obviously, it's not. So right. So serve again that notice to perform or quit. This is the third example of that. Um, okay. Where you describe, you first state in the notice that pursuant to the terms of the rental agreement, the premises must be kept in a neat and sanitary condition. And you right. say you in your unit, you have excess clutter. It's only a small path upon which to walk through the unit. You have garbage and decaying food and all kinds of other stuff. And I'm going to give you three days to clean it up. So okay. uh, if you want, we can assist you with that uh, by serving that notice at the end of the third day. Since these people do have a problem and nothing's going to happen at the end of the third day, we can go forward with an eviction. And we do those cases all the time. Okay, great. 
Thank okay. You. All right. So anything to do with selling uh, the property? Can I sell the property with them still here? Or what? Oh, of course, of course you can. But you can imagine the uptick in price if you got it, got her out and uh, and cleaned it up. So you're 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 leaving thousands and thousands of dollars on the table by not getting rid of this person. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. You know, it's unbelievable that the city of Los Angeles, uh, which never controlled, um, uh, which never controlled single family homes as now, and they still can't put rent controls on that. Now they have put uh, eviction controls on every residential unit in the city of Los Angeles, regardless of when it was built or when it was, uh, or what type of a unit it is. So it's, it's crazy. Let's move on to Ferry Saremi. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself, please. Hi, Dennis. Um, I just wanna educate myself. I have a case with you. Um, but, we're not gonna, but we're not gonna talk about your case. No, 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 we are not gonna- General questions. Just, I just want to educate myself that let's say if the eviction is a eviction going on and the lawsuit is um, applying, um, is a court I have, uh, you know, the, uh, for eviction, uh, let's say we have to wait for the court result or do we have to go to the court or? Well, in general, young lady, if, if the tenant doesn't contest the proceedings, then no court trial is required. Our paperwork goes to court, but we don't go to court. So uh, we would be uh, just per per performing and proceeding with a default judgment. Now, if your tenant contests the proceedings, then we're gonna have to request a trial and we have to wait for a trial date. Usually they come in about 30 days. How do we know that is if he's con uh, con contestant or not? Well, there's two ways. Number one, if he contests the proceedings, he's supposed to send uh, the attorney, the other attorney, that's us, a copy of what he filed with the court. Unfortunately, in most situations, they don't. But we have access, of course, to the court docket. So when we're taking a default, for example, we'll check to see that whether an answer has been filed or not. If it hasn't, we'll proceed forward with the default. If it has, then we'll immediately uh, send you a copy and then proceed forward to getting a trial date. Okay, and then that's gonna happen after 30 days that the lawsuit is applied to the court or the time that- No, the, the, the concept of a lawsuit works that you first serve a notice, like a notice to pay, rent, or quit, then you file a lawsuit, then you serve a lawsuit. Once you serve the lawsuit, in most cases, it's gonna be 15 business days for the tenant to respond. If he doesn't, on that fifth or the 16th day, we'll take a default, obtain a judgment, bring it over to a sheriff. If he does file within that 15 days an answer or contest the proceedings, we'll request a trial, and then we'll get a trial date in about 30 days. Okay. I'm going to move on, but thank you so much. Let's move on to AZ. AZ, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Hi, um, thank you so much for this service. I am the tenant. I'm gonna make this really quick, as quick as I can. Um, last summer, my on a Saturday night, my landlord, I'm a rent controlled apartment um, student. On a Saturday night, my landlord started demanding COVID protected accumulated rent monies that weren't obviously gonna be due until this last January. Well, let me stop you here. Yep. We're, uh, first of all, we're in the city of Los Angeles? Yes. Okay, so the COVID rent money was um, uh, due as of February 1st. Yes. Uh, and he can demand it. If you hadn't paid it from years before, he can demand it. And in fact, he can bring forth a small claims court action against you. It's paid. All my rent is paid. It has always been paid according to the housing department. On time, it's never been late. So why would he be demanding COVID rent if you don't owe any rent? I, I owed rent, but that rent, the due date for that was this last February, correct? That's correct, which is what yes. I just said. And yes. as of February 1st, he could make a demand for that COVID rent 
the rent that you didn't pay in the past. That's not the issue. I paid it last year. I paid it last year. I'm just going to cut to the chase and say that my landlord has now stopped accepting my rent as of May 1st. Um, There was a three-day comply quit put on my door that had nothing to do with money. I have never broken the lease. I have never caused a disturbance. I don't have roommates. I don't have pets. Well, you but you're going on to a laundry list of things. So, would so be, would, what in the notice? And we're going to have to cut this off. What in the notice did he claim that you were violating? My question for you is: Is it legal for him to cut off my ability to pay rent before an unlawful detainer has been? And given? the answer is: Every landlord is instructed by my office not to accept rent in the face of an unlawful detainer. Thank you very much. We are moving along. Uh, I don't know how succinct that last question was. Let's move on to Sal. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Hi, Mr. Block. Hello. Hi. So uh, my question was about uh, settlements with contested cases. Sure. The city of LA. What would you say are, um, I guess, uh, good terms for a, a landlord to accept for a settlement? Well, it all, I mean, it all depends. Let's pretend the tenant owes you, you know, $30,000 versus a tenant who owes you $300. I mean, so what you're willing to give up is based on really what's owed. Uh, Sometimes landlords are faced with a jury trial, so they'd rather settle the matter. A common settlement is 30 days waiver of the rent. But again, it all depends you, a particular situation and how strong your case is, you know, if the tenant's just, you know, playing games, which in my opinion, they do in 95% of the cases, then uh, it's, uh, it would tell you that you have a strong case, but are you facing a jury trial? Do you want to be uh, in a courtroom for two, three, four days and, and pay additional fees to an attorney? So a lot of landlords based on the garbage of our system, where a tenant can ask for a jury trial, uh, do want to settle the matter because economically it makes sense. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, because yeah, currently um, they owe uh, four months back back rent. They want that waived and an extra ninety days. And I was like, wow, that's yeah, outrageous. Is it a jury? Are they asking for a jury trial? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the system is broken. Uh, I'm the first to tell you. Uh, I have many clients who will just go say, I'm not doing that. I'm going to go forward with a, uh, with, with the trial. Uh, obviously, I mean, I know our fees are about one third of what most firms charge, but notwithstanding that it's still, it's still a, a sizable amount of money that's going to go for an attorney to do a jury trial, as you can imagine. So, so it's really an economic decision. I mean, I know that there are some, a lot of my clients are really principled, will not give up a penny. uh, And if it's a jury trial, then it's a jury trial. But, you know, a lot of them, uh, you know, have many, many, many units. If you're a mom and pop and you got four units and you're losing income on one and also putting money out, that's another consideration that you would have in that situation. But God knows that the uh, system is definitely broke, uh, that they are allowing Uh, jury trials. Uh, When I started practicing law back in 1977, uh, we would have, you know, six trials in downtown Los Angeles. Each trial would be heard that same day. Maybe they were 15, 20 minutes. uh, And the case would be over, win, lose, or draw, but the case would be over. And, you know, in 95% of the cases or 99% of the cases, we would win those cases. And we wouldn't really spend our time trying to settle the cases because it was just quicker to try them. Well, now it's a whole different story with the delays in the court system, with getting the court. If they do ask for a jury trial, guaranteed the first time you go down, they're ready for your jury trial. We announce ready. All of our documents are filed. The court's going to say that they don't have a courtroom available. So it's, uh, it's not a good situation. And The reason why, ladies and gentlemen, everybody should come out to Pasadena uh, this month, May 15th, and hear me speak, because I'm going to talk about how not to make a mistake with uh, getting getting a tenant. Thank you very much, Sal. Appreciate that. And I am going to move on to Austin. Austin, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. 
Good afternoon, Dennis. Uh, thank you for uh, following up on SB 567 from last week. Um, so I just wanted to kind of expand on that just a little bit further. Um, so the lease that I have uh, was entered uh, July 2021. And it I don't I'm just not convinced the verbiage is that's in the lease is going to allow for owner occupancy. So my question to you is, what is a good strategy uh, to do this? Should I uh, file a notice uh, for a change of terms on close of escrow when I officially own the property? Or should I ask the property manager to uh, uh, change terms immediately once I open escrow so that I can serve that 60 day notice uh, on close of escrow. Okay, if the phrase is not in your rental agreement that states that be advised that we might be asking you to move to put in ourselves or a family member, if that phrase is not in a contract that was entered into after July 1st, 2020, you are out of luck. You can't do a change of terms. That's not what the law says. You just can't use that as a reason. Now, what city is this property located in? Long Beach. Okay. And this is a single family residence? No, this is a fourplex. Yeah. So you've got a problem uh, based on that lease. But I'm sure maybe somebody else in the complex, their lease was prior to July 1st, 2020, correct? Uh, I, I don't know. I haven't opened escrow yet, so I don't have all the documents. But if I'm reading the the, the Long Beach Civil Code, which I, I believe is the same as the state rent control, if I can get the tenant to sign it to get them to agree to it, then I uh, uh, to you know essentially voluntarily vacate. Then I think that is an acceptable way to to owner occupy that. Right. So that's not a change of terms of tenancy. If you can get them to sign and just kind of slip it in, hey, I have my own rental agreements. I need you to sign this. If he signs it then fine, because then he signed it and it states that in there. So you're correct in that, but you can't do a change of terms of tenancy. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Have a good day. Okay, Michelle. Hello, Michelle. Why don't you unmute yourself and say hello? Hi, Dennis. Hi, um, I have, I'm in San Bernardino County, and I have a tenant that I served a three-day notice to on May 7th. And didn't pay the rent until actually till today. He came by my house to tell me that he paid the rent. And I'm wondering if I can still move forward and not accept the rent. He he didn't follow the terms of uh, what was in the three-day notice. He was supposed to come paid in person, and he actually just deposited it into the bank instead. Well, he can deposit it into the bank, uh, or he can deliver it in person. The issue is not how he paid it. The issue is when he paid it. You served a three-day notice on May 7th. The tenant had until May 10th to pay. If you didn't have the money on May 10th and under the law, you would have the right to proceed forward with an eviction. If he puts the money into your bank account, it's not something that, quote, you accepted because you didn't do anything to accept it. So you would have the right to send the money back by serve, by preparing your own personal check, making sure first that the money clears, and then uh -huh. send them your personal check with a note saying, you've made an unauthorized deposit into my account. And by doing that, um, uh, you will not be considered to have waived that notice that you served on May 7th. Okay. So I think, I think you're good. Now, as a practical matter, I'm talking to you what what the law is, right? Uh huh. And and God knows that uh, the courts, the judges are required to follow the law. Correct? Should be wrong. They don't follow the law. So <laughs> sometimes when it's a close thing like that, the judge just throws his head hands up and says, "Yeah, you got it on the fourth day. Who the hell cares?" If the judge follows the law, these tenants need to be evicted. But it can be a close call where uh, they got it there almost on time. Now, to me, a three-day notice is a three-day notice. It's not a three-day plus whatever I feel like notice. It's a three-day notice. So, uh, But again, it could certainly happen where you get some judge on some day, because we've seen everything, uh, mm -hmm. 
and and you know, and sometimes judges make tremendously bad mistakes in our favor. It doesn't just go one way where we have no chance of winning this case and we win the case. So it goes both ways, but more likely than not, it always goes in the way of the tenant. So let that be your conscience on that one. Thank you very much for your question. I'm moving on to Jonathan Kennedy. Hi, Dennis. Hi. Hi, Dennis. Um, just to, uh, I just want to clarify, I think it was the very first question about late fees. So if we are about, if we are wanting to evict a tenant for non-payment of rent, we really need to, and we've been applying their, the rent, pay, the sporadic rent payments that they've been making uh, towards the late fees. We really need to back those all out before we begin. Unless the Before tenant we serve the three day notice, the tenant has agreed to it. Uh, because if the tenant hasn't agreed to it, then that's really he was really just paying the the rent without the late charge, and you're applying it towards the late charge. But again, they what, agreed to it in the lease. Uh, did the lease specifically state that if you owe a late charge, that the first payment any payment received will be applied towards the late charge? Yes. Then that's a very clever lease. I like that. Well, uh, it's the CAR lease. Yeah. So then I like that. So then, yes, then it, then you're right on that issue, but only because that phrase is there. Okay. So I can just... Uh, you could serve a three-day notice for the rent. Because... For what for what's owed now, not worry about the late fees. You got it. Because the late fees are okay. already paid based on, the, based on a contract that your tenant signed that said, hey... Any money pays goes to late charge first. If he signed it, then that's then he's responsible. You know, there's a lot of uh, legal, uh, a lot of attorneys that just basically say out of hand, no, don't do it, back them all out, and they will not, absolutely will not go to bat for you and on I'll, that. And I'm telling you, those attorneys are not wrong because what they're dealing with is just the concept that I just talked about, is a judge going to follow the law? And and therefore, I mean, in my practice, we tend to be overly conservative because God knows I don't want to lose a case. Uh, so we tend to, you know, take the path of least resistance. But what so if, if I brought this three day notice to you, you would advise me to back out those late fees? Uh, I don't know. I, I really like that term in that. Uh, I think the attorneys probably are just just so dogmatic talking about what they always have done in the past. But I, I do like that phrase. And uh, I would certainly send uh, a letter to the tenant if you haven't done so saying, by the way, let's recap what you owe me uh, under the terms of the lease. I would kind of set the tenant up by sending him an explanation letter that by the terms of the lease, every time you pay me, if you owe me a late charge, I'm applying to that first. But you also have to understand that your late fee has to be a legal late fee provision, which has this specific language in it. Which I presume yeah, it does. So could I it. attach? Would you advise just attaching that to the three-day notice or sending it in advance? Or I would do an explanation letter first as okay. to how I'm getting to these figures and make a demand for payment. And then I would serve a three-day notice. Okay, thank you. You have a great day. By the way, this is what I did all morning because I was taking phone calls all morning from like nine to twelve. So you know what? I never get enough of it. So let's let's do it in the afternoons. Moving along to James Rutkowski. Say hello, Mr. Rutkowski. Good afternoon. Do you hear me, sir? I do. Are you in the basement? Oh, uh, not as uh, wonderful surroundings uh, background as as you, but uh, at any rate, <laughs> faulty religiously. Two questions: one dealing with uh, bed bug remediation costs, uh, namely, who is responsible? Is a bit of trivia. L.A. and San Francisco made it on Orskin's Orskin Pest Control's list of most bed bug infested cities. Clearly. If a tenant smashes out a window, we know who is responsible, but it's unclear. Uh, it's, it's hard to ascertain who's responsible for bringing bed bugs into a multi-unit building. So I'm wondering if you could provide uh, a bit of 
soliloquy about that. Happy to discuss that. Uh, always love talking about bed bugs. Uh, the reality is, is if the tenant negligently damaged the property, then the tenant is responsible uh, under a general contract theory and in most rental agreements. The issue is, you're right. If First of all, on that window issue, then you know it's the tenant. Well, the tenant's going to say, no, somebody from the street threw a rock through the window. So how do you even prove that? But, well, I was just making a comparison because uh, we know who's culpable in that case, but we don't know who's culpable. I, I, the tenants are going to say, and we're off topic a little bit, but the tenants are going to say somebody was walking around and threw a rock through the window. I didn't do it. So then you have to check to see whether the glass is on the inside of the unit or, or on the outside of the unit. But in, in any event, with regard to bug bites, it's very difficult to prove. I mean, if you could determine that the guy picked up a mattress in an alley and dragged it into the unit, okay, and that your pest control company uh, saw that that's where the infestation arose, then yeah, in that crazy scenario, you could hold your tenant responsible. Bottom line is don't waste your time. You're not gonna be able to hold the tenant responsible. What you need to do is you need to call up a responsible pest control company who will get in there immediately and arrest this problem because then it just spreads through the whole building. Well, second question, I'm not trying to be uh, argumentative or I, I'm, I'm just attempting to follow your train of thought from your last webinar in which you quoted a law professor who said that the law is not an ass. And what you meant by that is that there's no way around the intent of the law and so I'm wondering if the same thing can be said about putting multiple properties in an, in, in LLC uh, to escape or evade the security deposit limitation okay. as you submitted last week. Okay, so we changed subjects. So to bring everybody up to speed, uh, if you have a total of two buildings with four units, that will be an exception to the limitation on security deposits. Starting July 1st, 2024, you're only entitled to a one month security deposit with that exception that if you have a total of four units in two buildings, then you are allowed to um, have a, one, a two month security. So I was suggesting that if you had, let's say two, or let's say three duplexes, uh, put one in a um, LLC, and therefore, uh, that building uh, would not be considered the same owner. And I don't think that that what I talked about with regard to the form to the substance would apply. Because if you read the code, it says that a landlord, well, the landlord in this and for that one of those duplexes is an LLC. The landlord for the others are individuals. So I don't see a problem with that. And I'm actually going to be speaking about that in Pasadena as what I'm going to recommend people do. But of course, if you got a six unit building, you're dead. But if you've got units with either four or less units, that would be somewhat of a way to get around the law. Anyway, thank do you. I, do I have 10 more seconds? What's that? Do I have 10 more seconds? You do. Now, when you uh, talk in terms of... Um, Small claims court, uh, the limit's been raised to, I believe, 12500 Can you talk a little bit about uh, an eviction based on the theory of waste? Because it seems to me, if you're going to sue a tenant for $12,500 in damages, would that uh, otherwise qualify as committing waste? In other words, uh, the, the property is diminished in value. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, understand those two terms this was your 10 second question james yeah did i go over <laughs> i think probably about 20 times over okay let's talk about waste waste is synonymous with the word damage so if you got a tenant who took a pickaxe to the cabinets in the kitchen and destroyed them you got two things you can do number one you can evict them number two you can sue them for the damage when you evict somebody, you're not getting a judgment for the damage to the property to pay for the cost of that. What you're getting in an unlawful detainer, an eviction case, is you're getting the tenant thrown off the property, hopefully violently in this situation. And also you're getting a judgment for any rent owed during this time period. An unlawful detainer will not get you a judgment for the damage to the property. However, small claims court, 
will not evict the tenant, okay? They won't, but they will give you a judgment for the amount of damage to your property. Hopefully that answers that question. And I want to thank you. We're going to move on. Those are good questions, by the way. Sam, say hello, Sam. Sam Shabbat. Uh, yes, am I? Can you hear me? Okay. Sam, thank you, you Dennis. But how come you're talking on Shabbat? Oh, yeah. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah. <laughs> That's my name. Um, You're not supposed to be working today. No, I know. I know. Me neither, uh, but, you know. Yeah. You? yeah, my Hebrew name is Shalom. Um, anyway, um, thank you, Dennis, for taking my my question. Um, so, so my question involves something you alluded to earlier. Documentation of the condition of the demise premises on the incept upon the inception or beginning of the tenancy. Right. Le hypothetical. Lee says that the uh, place is in good, clean condition. The tenant agrees that it's in good, clean condition and it meets all whatever the seven or eight criteria it contained in the civil code. I can't remember what the code section is for that. Furthermore, tenant signs a, uh, a move-in condition report that says that everything is okay or good condition or whatever. However, tenant has documentation of or photographs of the con actual true condition of the premises and they have a front page of the LA Times and the date they took the photographs in the photograph. Uh, and they show these dilapidations that were left behind by the prior occupant or tenant. What's going to govern for most judges in a small in a security deposit dispute? Most judges, what would they go with? I'll give you a phrase. Are you ready? Yes. A picture is worth a thousand words. That would trump. That would trump the written, signed. I think so. If he can prove that that's the way the condition was, you know. Look, let me tell you something. Uh, Do you ever take a loan out on a house or an apartment? I haven't. I've always paid cash for stuff. Well, let's pretend you did. You ever, you ever okay. seen lo loan papers? Yeah, they're quite detailed and specific. Right. They're, they're and everybody just signs them. Do you th even me? Do you think anybody ever reads the forty, fifty pages that you're reading? You know. It's it, and you're going to sit there at, at the bank and you're going to sit there and start signing this and you you would be there till four days from that by the time. So yeah. people sign things and the judge judges know that. So I would think that if they can document that the premises were damaged uh, when they took it, notwithstanding that they signed off on a lease, I think that trumps it. Okay, thank you. And that that erodes away at the parole evidence rule, I believe. Look at you, little lawyer there. Oh, okay. Uh, Anyway, thank you. thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to, that was a good question, by the way, Sam. Uh, let's move on to Kathy. Kathy Lou, say hello. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, I serve a 60 days notice to uh, one of my tenants at the Dupac. Then they suddenly just move out in two or three weeks. Uh, but when I serve them, I offer pay them one month rent if they move out on time because my son plan to move to move in from outside state, but not until July. Now they already move out like uh, three weeks. So I'm not even asking the money, they, you know, the rent. I'm just, uh, they keep asking me, give them one month rent. But they break the lease. I mean, not break the lease. They, they, they didn't follow the 60 days rule. They just move out early. Do I still need to give them the, the, the one month win? Well, the tenants, uh, if you serve a 60 day notice and the tenant just moves out, the tenant is responsible to pay the rent for that 60 day period. But if you were going to give him one month's rent, well, wouldn't that be the the second month? So you're already you're already taking it from them. So I don't think you can charge them for that because that second month was supposed to be free as part of relocation because you've asked these tenants to move. And then when you do ask them, they get one month's relocation, which can be an offset of that last month's rent. So number one, I think you're fine. I would say nothing. They probably paid in the first six, first 30 days and the second 30 days, they don't owe you any money because they wouldn't have owed it to you anyway, because that was the month you were going to give them for free. But they asked me, gave them one month's rent right now. Do you I still gave them? You what? They ask me. It's not I'm asking them money. They ask me. Oh, well, no, well, that's, that's easy. 
just say no. <laughs> I don't have to pay you. You should have stayed there for the full 60 days. And right. if you moved earlier, that's yours. I, I don't have the place rented, so. Uh, my second question is, as a duplex, my next tenant, do I still offer my month's rent, give them a 60 days notice? Is that by law? I have to give them one month's rent? Anytime okay. you're asking a tenant to move because you want a family member to move in under statewide rent control, it is one month's rent, if that's what your question is. Okay. All right, thank you very much. We're going to move on to Razo. We snuck you in. Say hello. Hello. Um, I, this is I, for a question in Los Angeles. It's a triplex that was purchased with no rental agreements for all tenants. Um, I know you've mentioned in the past that you can't force a tenant to sign uh, an agreement, but how does this apply under the legal reasons for eviction of failure to renew similar rental agreement when there wasn't one? Okay, so first of all, they all have rental agreements, whether you know it or not. It's, it's either a written agreement or it's an oral agreement, but it is an agreement. Uh, what you're referring to is a cause to evict where a tenant refuses to sign a new rental agreement once the previous rental agreement expires. So if I had a one-year lease, we're now in the 12th month, and I'm now presenting that tenant with a new lease, uh, if the tenant doesn't want to sign the new lease starting the 13th month, I would have the right to evict. Of course, you don't want to accept any rent past that 12-month period. In your situation, it has nothing to do with that clause in the good cause to evict. In your situation, you're just on an oral rental agreement. There's, there's Nothing's renewing per se, so you can't force a tenant in that situation to sign a rental agreement. Okay, so every time there's like nuisances, it's just new notice, new notice, since they're not violating something that we well, have. For example, if the guy is shooting up the courtyard, okay, you don't have to have a rental, a written rental agreement. You're going to serve that tenant with a three day notice to quit based on outrageous nuisance behavior. The same thing is true if the city comes in and cites him for being a hoarder or he has a methamphetamine lab in the living room or something, some fun stuff like that then that would be considered a nuisance. Uh, but if he brings in extra people, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do with that because you don't have a rental agreement which limits the amount of people. Of course, if the tenant doesn't pay the rent, whether you have a written agreement or an oral agreement, that would, of course, be grounds for eviction. Thank you. All right. We got some more time here. Uh, I am going to move over to, uh, let's go to Harold. Harold, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Dennis, I didn't hear the whole beginning, but it was sounding like a nightmare. So I'm going to check that out later tonight and see if I can get to sleep after that. But that's the reality we live in. Um, I was wondering on contracts, the, you know, the car forms, California Association of Realtors. I think they have that part in there where you can have a uh, mediation arbitration. But do they? I'm not sure if they do that for lease forms. I'm not sure if mine was that. But if that was the case, how does that affect if uh, like I wanted to use your services, but they signed the form that, you know, we go to mediation or arbitration, okay. if it's an eviction. Those clauses have been deemed illegal in an unlawful attainer proceeding. So even if you have that in there, that you have the right to still go forward with an eviction. And then the, as far as attorney who collects, whoever wins has to pay the other attorney or how's that go? That's based on what the rental agreement says. So if the rental agreement has an attorney fee provision, it says to the prevailing party, you're entitled to, and it either says reasonable attorney's fees or it'll have a number. If for a landlord, you want to make sure it has a number uh, so that your the amount that award of attorney's fees against you would be limited. Right. And if you had neither, then it's the prevailing party has to pay the uh, so, their attorney right. paid. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very good. Very good. You're on point today. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, Harold. You're always a regular. We like you. And um, right now, I just want to remind everybody that, because we're coming up to the hour, that again, uh, Dennis Block will be speaking at the Pasadena Convention Center. I'll be there at uh, one o'clock. You can come a little earlier, walk around and uh, see all the booths and everybody else. I'll have a booth there so you can actually walk up to my booth. Uh, I have another attorney in the booth with us and I have our uh, collection people, if you want to talk about your judgments, 
And if you want to take a selfie with me, uh, feel free. Uh, but in any event, I want to thank everybody for coming out uh, today for this meeting. I will have this posted on YouTube pretty quickly. And uh, everybody, great weekend, and uh, everybody take care.